Well, good morning. It's nice to be with you today. Uh, Marty will be back next week. He and Liz have just returned from a trip to California. We need to keep our senior pastor and his wife in prayer. They've got two coming sorrows in their life, going to lose uh, family members that they love. And so it's necessary for them to go out to California. So keep them in your prayers and he'll be here next week. <clears throat> In my 40 years of ministry, I've seen a lot of dramatic answers to prayer. And frankly, I've also seen a number of my prayers that seemed to go unanswered. When they were answered, it built my faith, it strengthened my walk with God, seemed to help me in a confusing and disappointing life. Uh, but when they didn't seem to get answered, the silence of God seemed to be so strong as I wondered why those prayers were not answered. As a pastor, I enter into people with crisis as they're pouring out their hearts to the Lord, asking for prayers to be answered on their behalf or loved ones. And when they come to me questioning, why doesn't he seem to answer my prayer? I find that to be a difficult conversation to have. I cannot explain the ways of God. But I want to enter in with them and try to help them. But I want you to understand that even though I might experience confusion from time to time or questions, I am firmly convinced that God answers prayer. This is my testimony. It's the testimony of many of you. But equally true, most of us at one time or another have been like the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk when he asked, how long, O Lord, will I call for help and you not hear? Or like David, O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Now, is there some way that I could do something to better ensure that my prayers were answered? If there is, I would want to know what that is. I would want my prayers answered. And I'm grateful that we have a God who is a kind Heavenly Father who doesn't leave us to flounder in this life with difficult questions and issues, but instead, time and time again, provides answers to those questions, provides insights through the pages of Scripture. It's in the Bible that some of life's most perplexing questions are answered. So is there something that I can do to ensure that my prayers are more readily answered? I think that it gives some insight. First, I need to ask myself, have I actually prayed? Now, that might seem rudimentary or even uh, way too simplistic for some of you, kind of like Vince Lombardi holding up a football to a professional football player saying, gentlemen, this is a football. But there is a point that sometimes whenever I got my emotions running amok inside of me, whenever I'm sitting there stressing and straining and I'm thinking about God and why doesn't he work and I'm worried about this. But then I suddenly have a blazing insight that I haven't actually prayed and talked to God about this. I'm just stressing. I'm just worrying. I'll enter into counseling with people sometimes if a marriage is in difficulty and a person will be there and they'll be talking about their spouse who they think is rude to them and doesn't treat them right and they'll be castigating the spouse and I'll let it run for a while and then I'll ask a most basic question that, well, you've prayed about this, right? And you'll sometimes see them kind of lean back and the truthful answer is, well, no. And I think, well, that would be a good place for us to start. So whenever I say, have I actually prayed about this, I need to be reminded of what the scriptures teach. In Thessalonians, Paul writes, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He exhorts the Christians in Ephesus, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. Christ taught that when he was teaching his disciples out of Matthew 7. He, Christ teaches, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Now, I will never be able to do Greek as well as Marty has done it. We'll do it and always will do it. But I can tell you that the Greek tense here is a sense of continuing to ask. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. If you keep on, it will be open. You will find it. It will. It will. Keep on. 
So being faithful in prayer means that I have to choose to do it, which in my case means I have to schedule to do it. Whenever I have talked to some of you, I've explained that used to as I would slug into the Pentagon whenever I was still on active duty all those years and years <laughs> into the Pentagon, it was down to about a 20-minute ride from the slug parking lot. I would take 10 minutes to read my scripture in the back seat of somebody's car so that God had a chance to speak to me and talk to me about what he wanted to and work in my life through the word. And then I would end up praying for the rest of the ride about things I was concerned about, about my family, about things in the church here and other things. 20 minutes, I'm stepping out, going into the building. But it was regular, and it was regular for years in my life. I scheduled it in. That's how I chose to spend that 20 minutes every day in somebody's back seat. When you sit there and think of the example of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, in his moment of deepest need, he takes his disciples, and he takes three of them even further into the garden, and he asks them, stay alert and pray. He's in need. He's about to be arrested. He's about to die. Pray with me. And they keep falling asleep on him. And he comes back and he asks him a very simple question. Could you not pray with me for one hour? The answer in their case was no. We couldn't. I'm very grateful here at this church that the answer for a number of people in this church is yes, we can. Teresa Pennington, Melissa Cassell, who lead the prayer ministry for us, set aside the first Friday of every prayer. They go up to a classroom up here at 7 o'clock, and they hold prayer for an hour. They start off with some songs praising God. They give us a moment of silence to confess any sin between us and God, and then they get to the work of praying about the things that concern this church. Teresa was recently uh, heard in a car wreck, but she still organizes every week a phone conference that you can call in and participate to pray. You can put it on your schedule and you can pray with her. We have men who meet every Friday over here in the auditorium at 6, 6 a.m. They pray for an hour or as long as they can stay before they go off to work. And it's every Friday. They put it in their schedule. They are faithful to pray. The staff of this church meet every Monday together for a time of prayer. Some of them dealing with the prayer cards that you fill out. They put it in the schedule as a church staff to pray. And so the first fundamental rule, principle, requirement, whatever words you want to use of entrusting these things and seeing my prayers answered is that I need to be faithful and praying. Book of James, as he so bluntly speaks throughout that book, says it very plainly, you do not have because you do not ask God. It doesn't get much more simple than that, does it? There's a hymn that many of y'all have sung in the past called What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I could put my name in that hymn and it would be so true. Oh, what peace Michael often forfeits. Oh, what needless pain he bears, all because he does not carry everything to God in prayer. If I want God to answer my prayers, then I need to be faithful. And then it unleashes this incredible promise in the scriptures of the power of God working in our life. Going back to the church at Ephesus once again, in chapter 3, Paul writes, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we are able to ask or think. I can tell you, I can ask and I can think a lot. And he's saying you can't even scratch the surface of what God can do. To him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we could ask or think according to the power that works with us. But it all begins with being faithful in prayer. A second principle or a second requirement of scripture is have you prayed according to the will of God? And what I find is that whenever I say that, I find some people throw their hands up and say, yeah, 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 there's the escape clause. There's the bait and switch. There's the fine print. There's the disclaimer. There's the religious words you put there to protect God because you don't know if he's going to answer that prayer or not. I think, whoa, you couldn't be more mistaken possibly more jaded because the scriptures time and time and time and time again say that the truth is that answer prayer must be according to God's will 
Now, we get that a little mixed up sometimes trying to figure out what God's will is. We're going to talk about that here in a second. But understand that prayer is not a means whereas we wear a reluctant God out until he finally gives us what he didn't want to give us in the first place. That's a very pagan view of prayer. Prayer is rather we're coming to God for the fulfillment of his will, coming to a God who delights to answer prayer. Charles Spurgeon said a long time ago that the kingdom of God consists of this. Asking and receiving. He's your heavenly father. You're the child. You ask, you receive. You don't like that? That's not independent enough for you? Tough. That's the way it is. That's the way he set it up. You ask, you receive. That is the kingdom of God. Praying in the will of God means that my prayers are in harmony with God's plan for the world. It means that my petitions, my supplications are in harmony with his holy and righteous character. It means that I'm praying for him to out of the infinite wisdom and love that he has to give me what's best for me or for the others that I'm praying about, even though I might not ultimately know what is best. And it's so interesting to me that we don't have any trouble accepting that as parents if we have children let me illustrate when my kids were smaller and still living at home I would hold uh, pretty regularly what I would call a day with dad each one of them did it the other two weren't invited when it was a day with dad it's just you and me for a few hours usually on a Saturday morning and the rules are pretty simple you could ask me for anything the answer was going to be yes if it was my will <laughs> <laughs> but you could ask me for anything. So my youngest, let's say, wakes up. Maybe I'm uh, trying to let Laura actually have a, a few more minutes of sleep or something. So the first thing that he asks is, can we have pancakes? Yes. Get the stuff out, start mixing it up. Can you make the pancake look like Sonic the Hedgehog, which was a little character that he liked to play in an electronic game? Yes. As I drizzle it, I'm not sure it looks like a hedgehog, but yes, I can um, make it do that. As he's munching the pancakes, the requests continue. Can we ride bikes today? Yes. He thinks, Dad's a little more uh, risk-taking than Mom. Can we ride bikes all the way down to the lake today? Yes. He thinks, well, we're on a roll. <laughs> he eats a little more pancakes, and then suddenly he says, can Tommy come with us, his best friend at that time? No. <laughs> he eats a few more pancakes, and then he thinks, well, the old man must have just had a momentary lapse in the hearing or something. So he says again, can Tommy come with us? Silence from over around the stove. It's already been answered. No is an answer. It's not the answer he wanted, but it's an answer. Eat a few more pancakes, get ready to go. Finally, as we go out, he, he gets a little more earnest in the petition. Tommy is my best friend. I have the best times with him. Can he come? No. It's not according to my will. My will is that I'm spending time with you. I'm not even taking your brother and sister with you. Now, what would happen if that youngest uh, was to say, you know, you've disappointed me. You've spent this time, you've made some pancakes, we took the bike ride and stuff, but I'm disappointed that you didn't let Tommy come, or I'm disappointed that after a pancake breakfast you said no whenever I said, hey, can we swing by Dairy Queen or whatever, you know. I'm disappointed, so I reject you as my parent. I no longer want to have anything to do with you. How ridiculous is that? Except that people say it to God all the time. I'm always amazed at that. Relationship didn't work out. Somebody wasn't healed, job turned the wrong way, something disappointed you, I'm walking away from you. I think, how foolish is that? I see it all the time. My baby sister died much too young. Did I want her to die? Of course not. She's my baby sister. Of course it felt too soon. Of course it felt like a heartache. But the truth is... She's going to die one day anyway. 
God may have only appointed that she had these many days upon this earth. It says that pretty clearly in Hebrews that he's appointed one time for me, for you to die. You're not going to add a single minute to it. You're not going to lose a minute. It is going to occur exactly when he already knows it's going to happen. So can I accept that? Can I trust him even if he doesn't heal her? Or you suffer a broken engagement. This is the perfect person for me. This is who I know I'm supposed to marry. I know in the marrow of my bones, this is who I'm supposed to marry. What are you doing? I, you've got to make this work out or even worse. You've been married to somebody and then they act badly and suddenly you feel like you are a victim of divorce. I don't want to be divorced. I don't want to have this happen. I want my marriage to last. You pray. You pour your heart out. The engagement stays broken. The marriage ends. The persons go on and marry somebody else. You suddenly realize that prayer is not going to be answered. So then, in all honesty, it's like, well, I don't want to be alone. I don't like being lonely. I don't want this to happen. You've got to bring somebody else into my life. If he chooses not to, can you give thanks for the love that you did experience? Can you give thanks that he is ever with you? Or do you become embittered? I mean, it goes on and on and on. I can give you all these examples. Your body suddenly goes out of control. A career that you love may suddenly take a downturn or end. A beloved child that you raised so carefully in the faith may choose to walk away. Where are you and God at that moment as you're praying and he doesn't seem to answer? If we pray in the will of God, the scriptures teach that God will answer. But let's look at that will of God thing and understand a little better. In 1 John 5, look at what it says. This is the confidence which we have before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we've asked from him. These are great promises. We can come to God in prayer about anything. We can approach with the complete assurance that if we pray according to his will, he hears us and he's going to answer. There's no limit on it. We can eagerly anticipate the answer. But consider this example. Most of you are probably like me at a church service or a men's retreat or a women's meeting or something. You prayed, God, I want you to make me more like Christ. I want you to conform me to the image of Christ. Is that prayer according to the will of God? You better believe it. It's all throughout scripture. So he's instantly moving to work in that area to make you into it. What did he choose to do? He maybe had my child walk away from the faith. He maybe got me fired. He maybe has my body suddenly take a turn as I get older. And you think, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no, I, I want my child to come back. I, I love that job. I want this. And you're like, I got it. Pray about those things. I don't know as I'm praying, is that the will of God? Am I going to get that job back? Am I going to get a better one? I don't know. Was being conformed to the image of Christ according to the will of God? Yeah. Well, if I'd known you were going to take my child and make him into a rebel, if I'd known you were going to get me laid off as a chisel working in my life to make me in the image of Christ, I wouldn't have prayed the prayer. (laughs) I wasn't looking for that whenever I prayed it. But it's an assurance you have. That one's definitely according to his will. You prayed it, he starts moving. There's hundreds of them in the scripture. If I pray for God to raise up laborers to work in his vineyard to save souls, is that a prayer according to his will? Yeah, it's a commandment of Christ for me to pray that prayer. I can guarantee as soon as I pray it, he starts moving in people's lives, young people, Other people, he starts moving in lay people to start reaching out to their neighbors or their workmates. He starts moving for people to join missionary organizations, other things. It's according to his will. He hears us and we have the assurance we know he's going to answer it. We have hundreds of things in the scriptures that as you're a student of the scripture, you pray it. It's a guarantee he's going to start working. What we find ironic is, but when I prayed be more like you, I didn't expect to suddenly be struggling about some of these other things. 
but he is an all-wise, all-loving God. He can work all that together for good. And we get this will of God thing a little mixed up sometimes. We tend to think of it like a bullseye. Boom, you either hit will of God or else you're out of the will of God. And I don't see it like that in the pages of Scripture. The will of God is pretty clearly revealed in Scripture. I'm to witness to unbelievers. I'm to try to live a holy life in the power of the Spirit. I'm to study the Word and be a good uh, handler of the Word. I'm to give to the poor. It's spelled out what the will of God is. Whether I live at Fairfax Station or McLean, I don't think God cares. He's like, I can bless you either place. Can you afford to live in McLean? Great, buy a house. I care about are you doing what the scriptures are telling you to do as the will of God. Whether I become a dentist or a uh, long-distance truck driver, I don't think God really cares. He'll bless you either way if you're trying to work and do what scripture is clearly laid out as the will of God. All work has dignity. What do you like to do? You like to drive a long-distance truck and see the Rocky Mountains come up in the early morning? Do that for a living. It'll be fine. We get the will of God a little mixed up sometimes. The will of God is so clearly revealed in Scripture. Be a student of the Scripture, you'll be surprised how much. And then when you start praying for that will of God to happen, it's a guarantee. He's going to start working because you're praying according to that. Now, it's equally true that some things we request are not according to the will of God. James, once again, go back to the plain talk in the book of James, says in chapter 4, you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you can spend it on your pleasure. I mean, prayer is really God's appointed means for us to receive what's best and for others, for us to really discover what his good, perfect will is. But how many pairs of pants do I really need? How many meals can I eat? How much money do I need in the brokerage account? Now, we've got to watch out about that one because that's very personal to me. If you ask me how much money you need in the brokerage account, I'm probably going to say, oh, a little more would be okay. <laughs> but I don't know that I'm not just really praying for God to give me a little more of the American dream. I don't know if that's his will. I can pray, I can ask, but can I rest with what the answer is that's why i love the example of christ in the garden of gethsemane once again it's his darkest hour he's about to experience something he has never experienced from eternity past he and his father have always been together of like mind working together he knows that his father is about to turn his back upon him as he takes my sin and yours upon him. And he becomes the outcast because of our sin. He knows as a man, he's the perfect God man, he knows as a man he's about to die one of the most barbarous and torturous deaths that's ever been devised in the history of mankind. Frightening? Isolating? So he prays a prayer. You and I would pray too. If it's possible, let this cup pass. But what he follows immediately, I mean, it's like there's hardly a breath there. What does he follow it with? Not my will, but yours be done. Does the cup pass? No. He dies. What was the will? That a way for all of us to have access to a holy God is opened up. Because not my will, but your will be done. Jesus says that you get this as parents. He teaches very plainly that, hey, if your kids ask for something, you're not going to give them a snake or a stone if they ask for food. And he uses a word there that if you being evil, you don't think of yourself as evil when you're being a parent, but it's like compared to your heavenly father. If you being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more your heavenly father he teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, look at the birds of the air. They're not sowing, they're not plowing, they're not reaping, but they're not going hungry. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Look at the flowers of the field. Kings aren't dressed as well as them in their beauty. Your heavenly Father knows you need these things. Things about how tall you are, how many years of life you get, you can't do anything about that anyway. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be 
added to you. Do I do that? I can pray for anything. You can pray for anything. Can I sincerely, as the Lord taught me in that dark moment in Gethsemane, say truthfully, but not my will but yours. Ask you for anything as a kind Heavenly Father, but not my will but yours. And mean it? Now I'm praying in the will of God. Let's talk about time. God is outside time and uh, space. Um, does time have anything to do with the way your prayers are answered? Yeah. Yes, it does. Oftentimes, as many of you know, what seems to be a no isn't a no. It's simply a wait. I have a saying that, you know, God, as I've watched him work in my life and my prayer life, is never late, but he is, in fact, very rarely early. He seems to deliberately do that because he's building my faith in the process. Remember when Marty was teaching out of the book of Daniel? Daniel was taken into captivity as a young man. For 60 years, he prays for Jerusalem to be restored, for the temple to be rebuilt. 60 years he prays for that. Heavens just seem silent. Doesn't seem like they're going anywhere out of captivity. So he does what you and I should do. He starts looking in God's word, trying to understand what's going on. He comes to the scroll of Jeremiah, and he's looking, and he suddenly sees that God has already said, you're going to be in captivity for 70 years, not 69 and a half, not 70 and a half, 70 years, and then you're going to go back. And he looks at the timeline, oh, what do you know? It's six, year 68. It's right around the corner. It's right around happening. And then suddenly Ezra and some of the gang go back and rebuild the temple exactly when it was said that it was going to happen. I'm not going to rush God in the answer to the prayer, but that doesn't mean that it's not an answered prayer. Sometimes he's moving in my life. Sometimes he's moving in other people's lives. Sometimes he's changing world events as they are. A simple king will decide, yeah, you guys can go back and rebuild the temple. How many centuries did people pray for uh, Israel? to be established as a homeland. One day, a UN vote is an answer to prayer. Sometimes he's moving world events. Sometimes he's just chiseling away on me or you, but time certainly is a part of it. There's a hero of the faith from last century named George Mueller. He started some orphanages for children from really poor sections of town. And time and time again, as they would need the food to feed the children, as they would run out or the cupboards would be completely bare, they didn't go out, you know, hitting rich businessmen up in the area, even telling churches and stuff. He would gather the staff and they would get together and pray that we need some food. These kids are going to be hungry. We've got to have something. And time and time and time again, as they were gathered together in their staff meeting praying, a farmer is back in a wagon up to the orphanage, which meant that God had already moved in his heart days before because he had to pick it, he had to load it, had to drive it in town, had to be backing it up. God just like in the Sermon on the Mount, knows that you need these things, but Mueller and his people would pray and God would do a mighty work and meet every need. And those children wouldn't go hungry without him saying a word to anybody besides the staff and to his heavenly father. What I find interesting is that he would also pray for his friends who were not Christians. He had five friends. He was praying for them to become a Christian. He prayed every single day for them to become a Christian. After five years, one of them became a Christian. You think, wow, that's not a very good return on investment. Five years, the daily prayer, one of the five finally becomes a Christian. After 15 years of prayer, two, of, two more of them became a Christian. After 35 years of praying every day, the fourth one becomes a Christian. Mueller dies. Shortly after he dies, the fifth one becomes a Christian. God's timetable. Was it a yes? Yeah, it was a yes, but wait, I'm at work. Now, I find that one of the most searching questions whenever I'm going to the Lord in prayer has to do with me. If you sit there and you look at John 15, 7, Christ is teaching, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. Go ahead. You hear that from your Lord? Ask whatever you wish will be done for you. 
You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. When we end our prayers with, I pray in Jesus' name, that's not like a magical phrase like abracadabra we throw on there and it gives the prayer a little more mojo. Okay, I mentioned uh, Christ on it, so let's do that. It's an acknowledgement that the only reason I, as a sinful person, am praying to a holy God is in Christ's name, what he did for me. And so the Heavenly Father loves to exalt Christ. That's throughout the scripture. So he loves to exalt Christ because we're praying because of what Christ has done. But he's never going to do anything that's against his will. He loves to exalt his word, that it's true, that he doesn't lie in his word. So we take these verses and we claim them and we pray. But what I find is I have to look at my life as I go to the Lord in prayer. The psalmist said in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and, see, and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there is any hurtful way in me. The psalmist also says, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Do I have wickedness in my heart? Always and always and always. But what he's saying here is that when I go to the Lord in prayer and I have a time where I say, Lord, show me, search me, convict me of any sin, you don't get that sort of malaise that Satan does to you where he is always whispering and telling you, you're such a bad person, you're such a lousy Christian, you're such a hypocrite, you're such a... It's just this vague accusation. When the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, it's laser pointed. You were rude to your wife this morning. You exasperated your children. You stole that at work. You've been a coward about witnessing to your neighbors. It's very specific when he convicts of sin. And so then I confess it. And then like the psalmist said, but certainly God has heard. He's given heed to the voice of my prayer. I am always sinful. But that doesn't mean that I don't need to have a time of reflection. And as the Holy Spirit convicts me of specific sin, confess that. Now move out in prayer and join with the Lord trying to find out what his will is and pray about it. I love the fact that Teresa and Melissa teach all of us this simple acrostic of acts, A-C-T-S. They start off with a song or two, adoration, because we just join in with the voices of innumerable angels singing to God. Then they move it to a time of confession, usually a silent time uh, between me and God and everybody else that's in the room. We move to Thanksgiving, remembering how good the Lord has been to us, how good our life is. And then we move into the hard work of supplication for ourselves and other acts, A-C-T-S. I love that, that they teach that. I have to end... But let's ask one last question. What about faith? Does faith play a part in ensuring that your prayers are answered? Yes. In a simple phrase, a lot. <laughs> but faith isn't something that I work up in myself. Faith is always based on someone or something. I always had faith that my parents were going to be happy that I would come home and visit them. I never doubted that. I always had faith. Marty has talked about you have faith that you walk in here, you sit down in the chair, you have faith that's going to hold you up. It's always in someone or something that we have our faith. So it's not that I just have this great and never doubting faith and you not so much. That's why my prayers are answered and yours. Uh, it's not that at all. But what I find is that when you look at the examples in scriptures, did Christ ever not perform miracles because of a lack of faith? Yes. It says that in some towns he went there. You see the track record of him hurting people, coming with a disease and other things, and he heals them, and he says he goes into some towns, and he couldn't do any miracles because of their lack of faith. They didn't believe who he was. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. Even with all the stories, all the other things that they'd heard, they didn't believe him when they heard the words of life being taught by him. They didn't believe it, so he didn't do any miracles there. When Peter is in the boat and he sees Jesus walking on the water in the middle of a storm, he calls out to him that if that's you, bid me come out to you. What is Christ saying? Come on. So he steps out. He has faith. He steps out there in the middle of a storm and he defies physics and he stands on water. 
But suddenly he starts looking around. He's not looking at Christ. I'm in the middle of a storm. I'm doing something that's physically impossible. He starts doubting. He goes down. Christ grabs him, puts him in the boat, and rebukes him. Why did you doubt? Comes down off the Mount of Transfiguration. His disciples haven't been able to heal a demoniac young boy. He heals him. The father falls down like me saying, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. I don't have much faith. Help me. He heals him, but he rebukes his disciples because he's already given them power to cast out demons and do healings. It's a pretty stern public rebuke. Oh, unbelieving ones. How long do I have to put up with you? I mean, it's pretty harsh. So does faith have anything to do with Ensuring my prayers? Yes. But it's not because I work up such a great faith or I have so much. I want to have a strong faith, but my faith is weak. So mercifully, he says, well, you've got faith like a mustard seed. You can move a mountain because my faith is in him, not how much I gen it up myself, how much I have. Let's close with this. Hebrews 11.6 in James. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those to seek him. Then James, he says very clearly, you lack wisdom, you want wisdom, ask of God who gives generously and without reproach, it will be given, but you got to ask in faith. Don't doubt. The one who doubts, like surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind, you shouldn't expect that you're going to receive anything from the Lord. Because it's faith in him. It's not that I have such a great faith. I am like the man. I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Since this is Northern Virginia, we'll end with a chart. Let's throw up a chart. Does God uh, answer uh, prayer? Oh, yeah. How? Well, here's at least five ways. You pray, and he says, yes. I thought you'd never ask. Are you faithful in prayer? Or are you asking him? He says, yes, but not yet. I got some timing things I'm working on, either for you or somebody else or for an entire nation. No, that's an answer. But the real truth is no, because I love you too much to give you what you're asking for. There, I'm not going to give you that. Yes, but it's going to be very different than what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, yes, but more than you ever hoped or dreamed of. I pray that we would grow strong in faith and that our faith would abide in him as our kind Heavenly Father. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us the privilege of prayer because of Christ's sacrifice. Thank you that you hear us. May we grow strong in faith. May we pray according to your will. May we glorify you with our prayer life. Amen.